Now you notice the message this morning is why celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? Why should we come together and celebrate the resurrection of, Easter, of, uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why do we come and celebrate Easter? You'll notice I put right there, I should have had that in big caps, but I didn't do that. Let me tell you why I didn't put it in caps. I found out spell check doesn't spell check when you put it in full caps, and I wanted to make sure it was spelled right. Why do we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? Because it's factual. It happened. And there's evidence that proves it happens. Irrefutable evidence that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he arose on that third day. Now you notice that uh, Deanna and the wonderful ladies of our church, uh, they do just a wonderful job in putting together our stage up here and kind of illustrates. And you know, I'm, a, I'm a visual person, so I like to see and feel and touch things. It helps me to understand it a little bit more. And as I was scanning this and looking, and there's so much of this that tells the story of Christ. We, last week we had Palm Sunday. Do you remember that? Where he rode in on a donkey. I mean, the creator of the universe had the control of the animals. Remember last week we talked about, has anybody ever gotten on a donkey that has not been tamed? Well, first off, have you ever gotten on a donkey that has been tamed? All right? But God had control of that donkey as they rode him in. And remember we talked last week about that those that were there that were celebrating during that time of Passover, they thought Jesus was coming to be their what? To be their political leader that would lead them away from the Roman uh, army and from, and from, the, the, from, from all of what was taking place there in Rome. They, they had been persecuted and they thought Jesus was going to be their, uh, their savior, so to speak, uh, on the political arena to come and, and to save them during this physical abuse that they were getting. They didn't realize that Jesus came to be their savior from their sin had more than just what the earth could offer. He had eternal life. So we remember Palm Sunday, and then it's as we remember the Last Supper, remember Jesus was there with his disciples, and he said that, hey, listen, one of you in this room will betray me. They all looked at one another. You know, Jesus knew everything, and he knew who it would be. But yet Jesus chose him as one of the twelve. Why is that? Because prophecy had to be fulfilled. So Judas went and he sold Jesus 30 pieces of silver. And later on, the high priest sent their guards to come and to seize Jesus that night. One of the verses in the Word of God says that as they came to seize Christ, Peter pulled out his sword, and, and he went, and he cut the ear off of one of the guards, and Jesus just simply replaced it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd have been one of them guards that says, hey, man, that's cool, I'm out of here. I'm not, you, you, you're good to go, you know? But yet, they were blinded by what had happened. And at that very moment, Jesus uttered these words. He said that I could call my father, who would bring 12 legions of angels, and he could take care of this. And I'm paraphrasing. But Jesus willingly gave of himself. Wow. Hmm. That very night, in fact, Jesus had told Peter, when Peter said, Lord, I'll never let that happen to you. And, of course, you remember Peter used his sword. And in fact, Jesus also uttered the words that night, who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And Jesus had actually told Peter earlier that night that, Peter, I, I know you love me, but you, you see, you're going to deny me tonight three times. He, no, Jesus, that'll never happen. It won't happen. No, it, it will happen. In fact, before the rooster crows, it will happen. And you all remember the story. He didn't even want to be associated with Jesus. Hmm. Sadly, many today are like that, aren't they? Many today who sit in a house like this will leave this place, leave a house of worship because they're comfortable in the arena of Christians. But when they leave and go out and face the world, they park their faith in the church. They park their faith at home. Let me tell you what Jesus is looking for. Jesus is looking for soldiers in his army that are willing to wave the banner of the cross and to stand firm well the rest of what we see up here is 
they nailed Jesus to a cross. And they placed a crown of thorns on his head. Let me tell you what crown he's wearing today. He's wearing a king's crown today. (laughs) You see, they thought that when they put him in the tomb, it was over. They got rid of that. That troublemaker's in there. But he arose. Follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is going to tell us a story. He says, well, Marty, was that the message? No, no, that was just the preamble. We're just getting started, and I uh, hope you don't mind. It's Easter Sunday. We don't have a service tonight, and uh, many of you have had a pastry this morning. So, hey, listen, we're just going to have church all day. Is that okay with you? Some of you are visiting this morning. You're going, really? Serious? Is that what you guys do here? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Uh, in fact, one of the guys Thursday night said, Marty, we need to fix your clock. And I said, why? Has the message just been going longer? He says, yes. I said, that's okay. We're going to leave the clock the way it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. It's up on your screen. And this is, uh, this is Paul giving some factual words. Listen to what he says. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he's reiterating the very gospel that he had been preaching to them, and he is reiterating and exemplifying in his life the very gospel that he lives. Verse number 5. And that he, speaking of Jesus, appeared to Cephas. Now, who's Cephas? Anybody know a little trivia question here? That's Peter. That's Peter, another name for Peter. And he appeared to Peter, or to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And Paul here is talking about his Damascus Road meeting with Jesus Christ. Y'all remember that story, right? So Paul's talking about that there. He says, hey, listen, let me give you a witness account because this is the gospel. This is what we believe, the witness account. He says, let me reiterate, let me exemplify in my life that this is the gospel I believe. This is who Jesus is, and I know it to be true because he also appeared to me. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles. I love Paul's humility here, church. He says, I'm the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. You know what I love about Paul? Because he also gives his example of who he once was. And you know, by sharing that, he says, hey, listen, only Jesus could have changed my life. How many of you could testify to that this morning? How do I know Jesus lives? Because he changed my life. Paul says here, not only did I witness it, not only was he witnessed by 500, not only was he witnessed by his disciples, but Jesus changed lives, so I know it's factual that he lives. He goes on, if you'll pick up with me at verse number 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Now I'm going to share with you, and again, you're not getting any, you know, we're not going to charge you any extra for all these messages that are coming into this one message today. But let me tell you what Paul's saying here. He's already, he's already shared that there's factual evidence that he's been witnessed. He says, I have witnessed him myself. He says, not only have I witnessed him myself, but he says, I have been changed because of him. He goes on here and he says, if you don't believe that, then it's all for naught. But he says that's not true, because it is true. It is factual. And listen to what he says. He goes on here. Verse number 15, he says, Moreover, 
We are even found to be false witnesses of God, but we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, for your faith is worth, worthless, you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are, all, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Don't you just love what Paul says here? Man, if I could just take these, this, just this, this small group of verses and go out and just share, hey, listen, if nothing else, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you how I know that the resurrection, why I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he changed my life. And it's not in vain, because I'm not the same. I am a different person. Paul also says that old things are passed away, all things become new. Now, I don't know about you, church, but I believe everything I just read to you. I believe exactly what this book says. I believe exactly what Jesus did. Now, I don't know about you. I shared with that group this morning that was out at 29 degrees. I shared with them. In fact, I shared it in that song I sang for you. He made the blind to see. He made the lame to walk. He raised the dead. He walked on water. Now, if any among you have ever done that, please stand up and be counted. But that hasn't happened. In fact, there's only been two on the face of this earth that have ever walked on water, and that was Jesus, and Peter did. We don't know how many steps Peter did, but Peter kept his eyes on the Lord, and while he had his eyes on the Lord, he was walking on water. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is looking for some water walkers in this congregation. You know what that means? Jesus is looking for people that will keep their eyes focused on him and do what he wants them to do. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a water walker for Christ. Amen, church? Well, I want to share with you why we celebrate the resurrection. Well, number one, because it's factual, and we're going to talk about that this morning. How do I know it's factual? Well, first and foremost, the resurrection is fulfilled prophecy. You know, everything weaved throughout this book tells us that Jesus is coming, tells us what Jesus is going to do tells us that Jesus is going to die on the cross for our sins, tells us that Jesus will be raised from the dead, tells us that Jesus has prepared a place for us who believe in what I just said. Notice what Paul said in that first section there in verses 3 through 4. He said, I deliver this most important to you, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. Well, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand, you go back to the Old Testament, there's testimony of the cross. Listen what the prophet uh, in uh, Isaiah said, verses 3 and 6 of chapter 53. It's up on the screen for you. It says, he, speaking of Jesus, it says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Boy, I'll tell you, there's a lot of amen and should be going on there. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came to be your payment for sin on that Good Friday. How is it that Jesus could say, but for the joy of the cross? Now, many of you have probably watched many of the shows. And in fact, the, probably the most popular show is The Passion of the Christ. Many of you have probably turned your face and maybe even walked out of the room as they depicted the scourging from the soldiers to Jesus. As horrific, horrendous, as cruel as that was, my friend, I truly believe that that picture doesn't even capture what they did to Christ. It says he was unrecognizable. For what crime did he commit? Was it the crime that he made the blind to see? Was it a crime that he could heal the lame? Was it a crime that he could raise the dead? Was it a crime that he could walk on water? He could cause the winds to cease at his very command? Hmm. No. 
God sent him for a purpose. You see, he was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. For one reason, Jesus was sent, and that was for you and for me. He deserves all glory and praise from me. For by his stripes, I am healed. What does that mean? It's healed. I'm healed from the affliction caused by sin. I am healed by the death that sin requires. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I have a new body. You see, Jesus has saved me. Well, the testimony of the cross continues. Zechariah. Y'all know where that's at? Old Testament. Somewhere, right? Well, listen to verse number 10 of chapter 12. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Prophecy that Jesus Christ would go to the cross. There's also prophecy within the Old Testament of the resurrection. Did you know that? Look at Psalm, the psalmist. David, look what he said in verse number 10 of chapter 16. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One. Who's the Holy One, church? Jesus Christ. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, I don't know about you, but I know enough about the body that when you place it in a grave, it begins to what? Deteriorate to decay. Now, the Word of God says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But when sin came into this world, guess what happened to this body? Each Now, I know you don't want to hear this, but each and every day you're getting older. I know, I know it's a newsflash. But as you're getting older, now here's the part that I really have to be concerned about as I share this with you. Each and every day as you age, your body ages. It goes through a transformation that is not a positive transformation. Hmm. Hey, it is what it is. I can't fix that. And in fact, I was sharing with uh, one of our guests this morning. Uh, you know, you can go and get all the work you want done, but you're still old. Amen? Yeah. And sooner or later, this old body is going to give out. And by the way, I'm thankful for this body that the Lord gave me, you know. Yeah, I'm thankful for it. But this isn't the real me. You see, you just see what I'm housed in. This is just a tent. And this old tent's wearing out. But I will promise you this, because of Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to have me a new one. And it's going to be a glorified one. And it will never rot. It will never decay. You see, the Bible prophesied the cross of what Jesus would do for us. It prophesied that Jesus would be raised from the dead. That's a factual point, believing God's word. Well, what else? Jesus himself predicted his resurrection. Look in the New Testament. Here we go. John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it. Now, I would ask this trivia question. We don't have time this morning, but when was Jesus making this comment? When did he say this? Well, let me tell you when he said it. When Jesus walked into the temple, and he saw that they had made his temple, made the house of the Lord a mockery. They were in there, and they were exchanging money, changing money, selling animals, and selling vegetables, and all this other stuff. And what did Jesus do? He walked in, it says he was angered by what he had seen, what they had done to the house of the Lord. You know, I'm sad to say this, but we live in a world today where that's happening in many of the houses of God. They have made a mockery of his house. Let me tell you something, when you don't preach and you don't teach the word of God, you have made a mockery of his house. So Jesus turned over those temples. Remember what those guys asked him? Say, hey, listen, by what authority do you have to come in here and do this? And I love it when Jesus said, hey, listen, you can destroy this temple all you want to, but I'm going to raise it up again. Don't you know those guys probably walked away going, wow, that, that, man, that was, that was heavy stuff right there. They had no idea what he meant by that. 
Jesus predicted his resurrection. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of that fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Y'all remember the story of Jonah, right? Yeah. Jonah, the prophet, was supposed to go off and he was supposed to preach in Nineveh. And what did Jonah do? Nah, I'm not going. Again, another message in a message. What's so important about Easter? Because, listen, if you're a child of the king, God wants you to do something, you better do it. Hmm. Don't you know when Jonah was spit up, he probably said, you know what, I could have probably saved myself a lot of, <laughs> I was going to say heartburn, but the fish had that, you know. <laughs> but, he, you know, he said, I could probably have saved myself three days if I would have just done what God wanted me to do. You know, it's also amazing. I, I'm kind of a numbers person, and I like numbers, you know, seven being the perfect number, but I think three is an important number as well, you know. We look at the resurrection, Christ died on the cross three days in the belly of the earth and was raised from the dead. Y'all remember when Jesus was a little boy? Y'all remember? How many days was his parents looking for him? Three days. Did y'all know that? And, and when his parents found him, Mary and Joseph, hey, we've been looking for you. And what did Jesus say? He says, I've been about my father's business. Hmm. What was his father's business? To reach the lost. What was his father's business? To go to the cross, be raised again. Jesus predicted his resurrection as well. Now, factual evidence. Paul shared this with us. Not only was it prophesied, but the resurrection as well was witnessed. Follow along with me. Now, Paul said this in verses 5 and 8 of what we read in 1 Corinthians 15. He said he appeared to Cephas and to the 12, and he said he appeared to over 500 at one time. And then he said that, hey, listen, he'd also been seen by James, and Paul also said, I saw him. I saw him on the Damascus Road. Well, notice this in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. This is actually the story of Easter. It's recorded on all four of the Gospels, and of course it's recorded here in 1 Corinthians, as Paul explains. And you put them all together, and they tell the entire story. Some of the Gospels share about Mary, the two Marys that go to the tomb. You see where Paul mentions Peter, a prominent figure. Uh, some say, and I'm not going to get into any de debate about that, but some say that the reason that Paul brought out the disciples, it felt, they felt as if, well, if he mentions Cephas, if he mentions Peter and the other twelve, then it might be more believing for those. Because you have to understand, in that culture at that time, women were not looked upon in a high stature. Are you with me, church? And in fact, in some countries today, and we won't name any, women are not looked upon in high stature. But I'm telling you, I think it's very important that when we look in the gospel and we see that the two Marys were the brave ones that went to anoint the body of Christ, I think women are pretty important, don't you? Yes. So follow along with me in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. Listen to what it says. It says, Now after he had, he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. You think she loved the Lord? Yeah, loved him so much she went to his tomb. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they had heard that Jesus was alive and he had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. Now let me ask you a question. Why, church, did they refuse to believe it? Help me out. Why? Because they saw him nailed to a cross, and they saw this dead body placed in a tomb. Another message in a message. These disciples who had walked with Christ, who had seen him do all these incredible miracles that had never happened on the face of this earth, the raising of Jairus' daughter, raising of Lazarus after he'd been in the tomb. In fact, the Bible even records that, <laughs> that he stunk. Well, yeah, because the body's decaying. You're going to stink, right? You would have thought that when Jesus told his 12, I'm coming back, have no fear, you would have thought that they would have believed what had been reported to them. But it says they didn't believe it. In fact, so much so, y'all remember Thomas? 
Remember Thomas? Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I actually put my hand in that nail pierced side. Now, you know why I'm so thankful? Because the Bible records many of what some of us think. Well, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. Well, I'm here to tell you today, you're looking at a miracle. Because it wasn't my plan to be standing here preaching you a message. You see, I had another plan Marty wanted. I had another road and journey I was taking. And I was having a lot of fun along that journey. But you know what? Like Paul, I met Jesus along a Damascus road. And like Paul, Jesus changed my life. And I believe because I have seen what he's done in me. Sometimes the best example, the best story that you can tell to someone is to share your story of what Jesus did in your life. And again, Jesus is looking for those that will be the champions for him that will share the good news. But these said that they didn't believe. Verse 14, afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves and, and they were reclining at the table and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. I want you to listen to the account of Peter. Remember, Peter had denied him that night. You know, Peter was probably pretty down in the dumps when he saw Jesus, you know. I don't know about you, but had I been Peter, one of the only others that had ever walked on water, and then I had denied Jesus before he was crucified. I don't know about you, but when Jesus would have walked through those doors, I'd have hung my head low. How about you, church? Many of us today are hanging our heads low because we haven't answered his call. You see, God's got a call on each and every one of you. He's got a plan for your life. But many have chosen to walk the road and to do this journey on their own, to do it their own way. And my friend, I'm here to tell you that you're missing out. You're missing out. Now listen, God's got an eternity plan for you. But listen, while you're living here, God's got a better life for you as well. I told you I had another journey, had another path that I thought was best for me. I'm here to tell you I wouldn't trade this, any of this, for what I once had. Amen, church? So... The resurrection was witnessed by many. Listen to Peter, Acts chapter 2, verse 31. It says, He looked ahead and spoke the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Remember Psalms? It says he didn't suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. In verse number 15 of chapter 3, he says, But put to death the prince of life, and one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Notice, Peter didn't just say, not just that I'm a witness, but that we are witnesses. Acts chapter 10, verses 39, it says, We are witnesses of all these things we did both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Factual. Prophecy fulfilled. Witnessed. Number three, God changes lives. And I've weaved that throughout the message. God changes lives. And again, the best example of the resurrection of Christ, Paul gave it there in verses 9 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, hey, listen. He said, I persecuted the church of God. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. What was Paul saying? It's because of that resurrection, because of that change through Jesus Christ, I'm no longer what I once was. But today, I am what I am through him. He goes on and he says, his grace toward me did not prove vain. How many of you could say that this morning? By grace, we are saved not of works, lest any of us should boast. You see, our salvation doesn't come from anything that we can do. It came from everything that he did on the cross. That's where our salvation comes from. What a great testimony Paul gave. 
He says, you know what? I was a learned man, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, my mission was to persecute the church, to annihilate and destroy as many Christians as possible. He was even there in church, if you remember the story, one of the great preachers of the gospel, Stephen, he was even there holding the cloak of Stephen as he was stoned to death. Yet Jesus chose Paul to use him to be one, I think, the greatest church planners of all time. And he's sharing this with the church of Corinth. So what happened after the resurrection? What's part of that story? Well, we know that Paul's life changed. We know that Peter's life changed. You know what? Peter had courage. You know the first message that Peter preached there in the book of Acts? Over 3,000 came to know Jesus Christ. Now I remember when the Lord called me to preach. And I remember reading that. I said, wow, that's awesome. My first preaching experience wasn't 3,000. It was one. But I'm here to tell you Jesus Christ died for the one. You remember the woman at the well. You know, Jesus loves just one. He came for all of us, but he took time for just one. Peter got the courage to go out and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. James, who had doubted his faith, no longer doubted his faith. Many of these men became martyrs for the gospel and the call of Christ. Changed our Sabbath into a Sunday, a celebration, a resurrection Sunday. The Jewish remnant became the Christian church because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll finish up with this. The factual evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is it proves that there is an alternative to death. Hmm. How many of you would like to have an alternative to death? I mean, that just kind of, you know, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Hey, listen, do you want to die in your sins? You want to know that when you die that you got a place you're going? You don't want to go to this place called hell because, you know, God didn't create that for you. That was really created for the demons and, and, and all of those. But you know what? If you refuse to accept Christ, that's your alternative. don't know about you, but I want the other option. I'll take door number one. Amen, church? Amen. Marty, come on, that's just a fantasy. No, you know, how do I know it's true? Because he changed me. Nothing else could have ever done that. Coincidence? Absolutely not. Have there been other miracles that I have witnessed and seen in my own life? Yes. If I had time, I would share them with you. Many of you saw the email I put out this week. Isn't it amazing how God always puts people in your path that will be encouragers to you, people that you don't even know? This past week, I shared in the email. I was over at a, at a, at a prayer meeting that they have the first Thursday of every month at City Hall. Praise God that we still live in an area of this country where you can go in a government building and you can pray. You need to pray that that continues. In fact, you need to pray that there be a revival that takes place. Well, how does that happen? That happens because people are willing to live their faith and not be embarrassed and bashful about it. Well, as we finish praying, and I had the opportunity to pray for our soldiers, to pray for our country, and then just to pray and thank God for being God. Lord, I'm not asking for anything. I just want to love on you. How many of us take time to do that? Listen, Lord, I love you, but i, I got to get my laundry list here. If you can help me out with this. Let me encourage you. Why don't you just take time and just love on him today? Don't ask him for nothing. Thank him for what he's already done. Well, I'm in that room, and, and as I get done, these two ladies, they grab me outside. And I'm, I, you'd be proud of me because I didn't even have a Fellowship at Hill shirt on. I was undercover. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and these two ladies walked up and they says, you're Pastor Marty from over at Fellowship of the Hills. I said, yes, ma'am, uh, to, the, to the two ladies, I am. And they said, we want to thank you. I said, what did I do? And they said, well, Fellowship of the Hills, last year, several months ago, hosted a pray out cancer night where you opened up to the community and had folks come in and just, just pray for healing. Trusting in God, believing in God and his power. And I said, well, yeah, it was, it was a blessing for us. 
No, we had a, had a full house here. We prayed not only for those that are stricken with that horrible disease. We prayed for the caregivers. We had doctors that came and spoke. We prayed over the doctors. I believe God uses them as his instruments with the gifts and the talents that he has given them. And these two ladies says, I want to share something with you. Now, folks, this is almost a year later. I have no idea who these people were, but God had anointed that time for me to be there, to pray at that time, so he could bless me. You see, that was a blessing for me. And they said, I want to share something with you. I had cancer, and I don't have it anymore. Man, I wanted to shout right there, but we weren't done. And the other one said, and I believe it was her brother. She says, we had prayed, you know, the, the group, we had prayed, and of course, I didn't know these people. Prayed over her brother, and her brother was healed. This morning, Gary walked in after reading that note, and he says, I need to share with you about another person that came. Three reports this week of over a year ago. Now, I don't know about you, but that testifies to the factual evidence that I serve a living Savior. Amen. It cannot be refuted. Hmm. Well, notice what Paul says here in verse number 20. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Factual evidence. Only Christianity provides a comprehensive explanation for the reality of death. But it is satisfied and it answers the problem of death in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only Christianity is factual. It's the only, and I hate to even use this word religion because I don't consider Christianity a religion. I consider it a relationship. There's a lot of religions out there, and this ain't one of them. This is a relationship with God with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if you were to associate it and to put it in that conglomerate of what is called a religion, it's the only one authenticated. <laughs> it's the only one that has proof. It's the only one that has a risen Savior. <laughs> Y'all remember? Man, I, I, I love the Word of God. Because to me, you know, the, the Lord puts everything in there. Do you remember when them dudes were standing there? I believe it was Elijah, yeah. <laughs> and they were, you know, they were trying to get their, their God to burn this thing. Y'all remember the story? <laughs> and, and, and I love it when he says, you know, hey, listen, maybe you need to yell a little louder so we can hear you, you know. Don't you love, I think that's hilarious to me. You know what's even funnier is when it became his time, when their God didn't answer, when we knew it wasn't going to happen. He says, hey, listen, I know we said we were going to do this, but. My God's powerful. Put some water on it. Really? Pour some water on it? Pour some water on it. And you know what? I, you, sometimes you see my emails. I love it when God not only shows up, but he shows off. <laughs> you know? Not only did he consume it, he lapped up all the water, but poof, he took care of the rest of business there, didn't he? You see, that's the God I serve. That's the proof in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Factual evidence. What Jesus did on the cross, what he did when he walked out of the tomb. There is no evidence to refute that. There is no other religious leader who has ever done, will ever do, or could ever do what Jesus did. And for that, we say amen.